All right, we're uh, entering into the very PG-13 uh, slash R-rated world of the Miller's Tale. And um, so I'll just let you be forewarned. You've already uh, looked at it, no doubt, so you know what's going on. But there's, you know, it'll be a little bit a little bit bawdy. This is what everybody remembers from Chaucer, although you and I know it's not the, the main thing that he did. Uh, but yeah, the Miller's Tale, I want to first look at the Miller as he appeared in the general prologue. Actually, it's kind of sick in that picture, but uh, he is um, got red hair. He's got a big red beard. He's got kind of a red face, all of which mean that he is sanguine, which is in the medieval theory of humors means that you have a lot of blood in your system, which makes you sort of jolly and lusty. Uh, the wife of Bath also is sanguine, uh, if that gives you any clue as to personality type here. Uh, so he is he is basically kind of a happy guy. He's not necessarily a very uh, nice guy or um, a good guy, but he is a happy guy. Um, he also is, we know, big and strong. It says he's big of, of bones and brawn uh, and that he wins wrestling matches. They would have wrestling up at the county fair and places like that. He would always win. And that he could open doors by running at them with his head. So he's he's also not uh, particularly strong. Uh, I mean, particularly smart. I don't think he is particularly strong. I don't think he's very smart. Um He's a miller, which means he, he owns a mill, probably a water mill. And if you're a farmer, you bring your grain to him and he grinds it into flour. Uh, it says in the general prologue, he has a thumb of gold, which means that uh, just like a green thumb, you can produce plants. A gold thumb means you can produce gold. Uh, but it's got a, a double meaning that he he's a cheat. And in fact, it says he, he can take three times as much as he as he ought to. Um, and the thumb of gold probably has to do with him resting his thumb on the scales when he's weighing out uh, the the grain to begin with, and he makes he he, he tips the scale in his own favor, uh, literally tips the scale. So that's that's the thumb of gold. So he's he's a, a cheater. Um, and it also says he's a goliard, and the goliards were these I think 12th and 13th century monks. Uh, from Germany, and they were famous for their uh, dirty drinking songs and, and erotic poetry and things like that. And so him being a Goliard means that he likes to tell dirty stories, dirty jokes. Uh, and this is um, not a surprise, and it's also Chaucer's kind of way of warning you way back in the general prologue that when you get to his tale, that's probably going to be what it is, uh, because you, you know what kind of person he is. Uh, so we know that about him. And then what we find out, and, and again, not surprisingly, uh, in the, the Miller's prologue to the tale is that he is a drunk uh, because um, his tale follows right after the Knight's Tale. And so after the Knight's Tale, it talks about everyone in the company agreed that this was a good and noble story except for the Miller. And the host asks for the monk to tell the next tale, but the Miller interrupts and he, he is so loud and so obnoxious. He says, I know a story that I'm going to quita the Kanishtas Tala. I, I'm going to repay the Knight's Tale. Now, repay might have a good sense. You know, I'm going to pay him back for this favor he did us. Uh, but in the Miller's case, it's kind of revenge. I'm going to get him back for making me listen to this long and uh, very worthy and noble story. And um, he says, uh, at the beginning of this tale, he says, uh, please excuse me. For whatever I say, um, I am drunk, and so if I say something amiss, don't blame me, blame the beer, which is is, is pretty funny. Um, it says he's so drunk he can barely sit on his horse, and yet we're on, only on the second story of the first day, so it's maybe 9 o'clock in the morning. And this guy is already so drunk he can barely sit horseback. Uh, and he's a big guy, so it takes more than, than a beer or two to get him... Uh, kind of hyped up like this. Um, but it's interesting because he sort of says, if I tell a story that's offensive, don't blame me, blame the beer. And then Chaucer goes on to say, um, if you don't like the story, don't blame me, blame the Miller, because you know what kind of guy he is. But it's a, you know, it's kind of an interesting sort of meta-meta commentary because, of course, there is no Miller and there is no beer. Uh, there's only Chaucer. So if Chaucer... If Chaucer's Miller tells you a, a, a dirty joke, it's because Chaucer wants him to. Chaucer created the Miller, and he created the 
fictional beer that's in his system. So, uh, but here, yes, yeah, so the portrait of the Miller, he's kind of a party guy. Uh, he's kind of a lout. Uh, he's, he's sort of funny, um, but you don't want to put up with him for, and he plays the bagpipe, which he's, um, the loudest, most obnoxious character plays the loudest, most obnoxious musical instrument. And it says he's always the first one uh, who leads us everywhere. So you've got this big drunk bagpipe player <laughs> leading your group everywhere you go, which is for a religious pilgrimage is maybe not what you want. I don't know. So now we get the story, and this is this is where I have my my uh, PG thirteen plus rated pictures here, uh, and the kind of and and I'll, I will just say yes, the first one is a guy um, farting through a trumpet, and the second one is a nun harvesting uh, a phallus tree. Uh, so there you go. We never thought you'd see that picture, um, and this is because these stories are fablio. This is a fablio. And it is a French form, uh, which um, I will leave you to do with that information what you will. And there are about 150 or so of these in French. There are very few in English. Chaucer has a few, and there are a couple more. Uh, but it's mostly a French form, and these are pretty much short, dirty stories. They use, the Chaucer's, by the way, the Miller's Tale, the Reeves' Tale, are very mild. The ones that are really bad, I... I would even blush to tell you the titles of them, which I won't do. Uh, and if you want to email me privately and ask, that's fine. Um, but they are so filthy and foul. And they're mostly not that funny is the thing. I mean, the, the Chaucer ones are funny, but they're not so funny. Um, but yeah, they're short, dirty story. There's usually some kind of uh, toilet humor involved. There's almost always sex involved, usually adulterous. Uh, and they're very much amoral stories. The, the, there's, there's not really good guys and bad guys as much as there are smart guys and dumb guys. And then the women are just used for sex. And it very often borders on, uh, you know, the, the edges of consensuality and things like that. So uh, not surprising. But anyway, the Miller's Tales of Fablio and then the Reeve Tales one, the Merchant's Tales of Fablio, the Cook's Tale. Uh, there are a few of them, the Friar's Tale, uh, like that. So... Um, we'll move on there. So the, the Miller's Tale, the Fablio, is basically a, it, it's, it's a sitcom. It's a situation comedy. Uh, it's a comedy where, um, Nicholas the clerk, uh, seduces Allison, the, the housewife of the older man. Uh, meanwhile, there's another, uh, a church worker, a, a church, um, secretary named Absalom who lust after uh, Allison as well and you have these sort of two themes going on one is is what we call the misdirected kiss where Absalom thinks that he's kissing Allison and actually kisses her rear parts uh, and then there's the story of Noah's second flood where the the old man John uh, is convinced that Noah's flood is coming again and he spends the night hanging in a bucket suspended from the rafters of his barn and when he thinks the flood has come he cuts the rope and of course there's no flood so he smashes through the floor of his barn into the cellar. Um, so I'll let you um, find a good translation for this because the story is really, really funny, but it's it's hard to to, to get everything if you don't um, if you're not getting the the basic meaning of the words. But Fablio generally are are these. They're they're situation comedies. There's not a lot of character development. Uh, there, there's, there aren't puns per se, you know, it's not that kind of humor. It's strictly sort of sketch comedy, uh, farce, uh, kind of humor. Um, but I do want to talk about Allison. Uh, Allison is the, the, I don't know if I want to call her the heroine or not. She is the woman. She is the object of desire. She's about, uh, 18. She is 18. It says very explicitly. And she has recently been wedded to um, John, who is a carpenter who's about 60. So you can let that sink in for a second. This is, I don't know if it's a marriage that she absolutely didn't want, but I doubt she had much to do with it. I think this is something that her parents arranged. There might have been a, a John, John is a, um, is a middle class man. He, he's a self-made man. He's not got a title. He doesn't own a lot of lands. Uh, I think he has a small farm, but he's not sort of an earl or anything. But he uh, has made some money uh, by being a um, carpenter uh, and is kind of a, a well-known man in town. And so Allison is a trophy wife. Uh, she is really good looking. She's kind of a party girl. It says uh, that she is wild and young. And 
of course, what the Miller says, and what I think we're supposed to, to at least a little bit agree with, is he was foolish to marry her. This is the character of what we will call the, the Senex of Moms, and I'll talk about that later, but the old man in love, and he marries this, this beautiful young woman, and the implication in Fablio is always he's not appropriate for her sexually. Uh, he cannot possibly be, be a satisfactory partner to her. Uh, and therefore, it, it's almost a given. I mean, if, 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 I, if I'm sitting around with someone and I say, all right, a blonde, a redhead, and a rabbi walk into a bar, immediately you know what kind of story that is. It's, it's going to be some kind of joke, and it, it might not even be a perfectly <laughs> appropriate joke. Um, when we have the opening of the story where once upon a time there was an old man married to a young woman and he rented a room to a young graduate student, immediately Chaucer's audience would know where this was going. Uh, er, all that remains is to see how, how does he get her in bed, uh, because that, that's absolutely what's going to happen. So, uh, but Allison, I want to talk about her for a minute because she's an interesting character, not in terms of her psychology, but just that Chaucer is, for one of the first times, presenting us with a beautiful, desirable woman uh, in medieval literature who is not a princess, right? She's not a, you know, she doesn't have alabaster uh, skin. She's not cold and aloof. She's not, she's not going to make uh, Nicholas wait for a year, uh, certainly, to, to have his way. And if you go back and look through the description of her, which is about, you know, starting about line 3200 or so, you'll see that she, she is very beautiful. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about it. But what she's compared to, whereas a princess might get comparisons to diamonds and gold and uh, things like that, she's compared to um, a colt, to a, to a, a kid, like a, to a baby goat, uh, to a swallow, um, to her mouth is as sweet as apples. All the compares, all, all these metaphors that are being used are, are sort of rural. They're sort of farm, country kind of metaphors. And what she is is a, you know, kind of a middle American farm girl in some ways. I mean, this, is, but, uh, you know, but in medieval England. And Chaucer's being a little bit uh, groundbreaking here in a weird way by making a beautiful, desirable country girl. Because up to this point in, in the literature, country girls are there to sort of be made fun of. Uh, and, and she is being made fun of, don't, don't mistake, but she is as gorgeous as any princess. She's as desirable as whatever ice queen in a courtly love story that you want to think of. Um, and he spends a lot of time on the description of her. It's very, very um, detailed. And we hear about her clothes. And again, her clothes, she's not wearing a crown or anything, but they're very fashionable. And she is, she's working the old man's credit card pretty hard. Uh, I think that since she has to be married to him, she is um, kind of reaping the benefit of it as best she can. So uh, this painting, which I think is from about 1913 or so, um, it pretty accurately uh, uh, portrays what she described as, as wearing uh, and the fact that she's got this sort of slim figure and, and she's very girlish uh, in her way. Um, it, I've got a couple of quotes here. One is at the end of her description. It says she was a, a primrose, a pig's knee, and those are both wildflowers. And you notice they are, they are wildflowers and not, um, not roses and, and things like that. Uh, but she was a primrose, a pig's knee, for any lord to lay in his bed or for any good yeoman to wed. And it's interesting because Chaucer is locating her really, really precisely in her class system. What kind of girl is she? She's good enough for a, a lord, someone with a title, uh, to have sex with. She, she would be a good mistress if you were, a, you know, an earl or a duke. But you can't marry a girl like that. You have to marry someone of good family. You have to marry someone uh, at least of good reputation, which she probably doesn't sound like she is. Um, but if you want to have her as, as your, you know, girl on the side, you can. And, or, it says, or yet for any good yeoman to wed. And, and John is a yeoman. A um, yeoman is a citizen. Uh, probably a landowner has rights, but doesn't have a title, isn't part of the aristocracy. So, um, right, how good is she? She's good enough for a lord to have as a mistress um, or good enough for a, a wealthy citizen to marry as sort of trophy wife uh, uh, number one or whatever. 
So that, and, and so, you know, when I talk about Chaucer being interested in class, um, the sexualization of women very much is dependent on class and this idea of um, she's no better than she should be, maybe. Right? She's got, um, she's not too picky about her m sexual morality anyway, but she doesn't, um, doesn't need to be. Um, because she's cute enough to get away with it, I think. Um, it's. I don't think it's... Ne Allison is a really, really common name in the Middle Ages. There are lots of songs that are written to Allison. But I also think that it's notable and probably not accidental that the wife of Bath is also named Allison. And when we get to her tale, she talks about how in her youth she was married to older men several times. Uh, and I think it's fairly easy to imagine this Allison as, as being that Allison in, in a different incarnation. Uh, the other quote I have down here is when Nicholas, uh, the the clerk, the, the guy who rents the room, who is trying to seduce Allison, um, actually seduces her. And uh, it, it's it's a little bit racy and off-color, but I think it's it's interesting enough to, to look at. Uh, so we have this long description of Allison and how, how good-looking she is. Uh, and, and compared to all the to, to animals, to wild animals, she's someone who's got no... Um, check on her animal passions. You know, she strictly runs off of appetite uh, and, and pretty much nothing else. And so we have this. So, so uh, now, sir, and again, sir, so it happened one day, uh, this Henda, Henda Nicholas, Henda is this great word that means clever, handsome, uh, cool, uh, uh, able to get away with anything. Uh, so Hen and Nicholas began with this young wife to, to flirt and play while her husband was at, a, at Osney at another town. Um, and it says, as clerks are very subtle and very quaint, very um, clever, uh, secretly he grabbed her by the quainta, and privily he couched her by the quainta, and say that you is but if uh, but if he shove me willa for there in the love of the lamb and he spiller um and and he grabbed her by the canta and that is a very dirty word uh that we have in english now still and it starts with a c um and again if i'm not gonna say it but if you if you must email me to ask me i will i will answer you uh so it, nicholas's idea of flirtation is to just put his hand between her legs and grab her. And he says, unless I have you, um, I'm going to die. And he held her hard by the haunch bones. So he just grabs her, her rear and pulls her up to him and says, love me all at once or I will die. And she, she holds out for a good 20 or 30 seconds. Um, and then she, she agrees. And they agree that they're going to consummate their love. But um, anyway, so yeah, this is this is Allison. I think she's I, I, again. I don't think that she's going to be held up as, as a heroine. But if you think about her in comparison, say to Emily uh, in the last story, um, Emily is noble and wonderful, and she does eventually marry Palamon. Uh, Allison is whatever you want to say about her. She gets what she wants. I mean, she's she's put into a marriage, which is not probably her first choice. Uh, and it's sexually probably pretty unsatisfying. So she just goes out and gets a lover. And, you know, I can't admire it, and I can't, you know, say that I think Chaucer's trying to admire it, but there is an element of self-efficacy and determination here. I mean, she has, uh, in, in, you know, what I suppose is a pretty misguided way, figured out a way to have some sort of power and, and will in a world that denies both of those things uh, to women pretty pretty categorically. So anyway, I, th I think she's interesting, to say the least. Like the wife of Bath, she is a, a, a problematic character, but one who's got a lot of, of gumption, even if it's, you know, possibly misdirected gumption, I guess. So the themes uh, of, of the Miller's Tale, uh, yeah, the Fablio rules. The Fablio rules being that... Um, Good guys finish last, usually, unless they're also very clever good guys, but they usually aren't. Um, that the, the guy who is the most um, clever is the one who gets to have sex with the girl that he wants. Uh, also, the, the theme of the Senex Amans, which is Latin means the old man in love, and this is a stereotype that dates back to Roman comedies, uh, the idea being that um, 
he's fool. The old man in love is foolish. Even Cicero said that that you shouldn't marry. If you're a man, you shouldn't marry a woman much younger than you are. Uh, and yet it happens constantly. It happens daily. And uh, this in, in a fablio, that guy is always going to be the, the loser. He's always going to end up on the wrong end of things. Um, we have the two fablio motifs. Uh, motifs that are repeated from countless fablio, but this is the first time they're brought together. This is what Chaucer's so good at. You've got the um, misdirected kiss motif uh, with the kissing of rears and the farting and the red hot poker and everything else. And then you've got the Noah's Flood motif where you have the foolish person who's convinced Noah's Flood is coming back, which of course if, if if you've been to Sunday school, you're supposed to know that there's not going to be another flood, but that's as part of the foolishness of these characters is that they can be duped into believing that that's, that's going to happen again. Um, another theme, who, who in the story escapes unscathed? Even Nicholas, who is the clever one who gets to bed, Allison uh, has these horrible third degree burns in between his, his butt cheeks. I mean, it's not, he's not unscathed. The person who gets away unscathed, of course, is Allison because the hot girl gets what the hot girl wants and she does not get punished for it. Um, she is once again, a little bit like, you know, again, it, it makes a nice contrast with, um, uh, uh, the Knight's Tale. If you think about Absalom and Nicholas as being like the cousins, Palamon and Arcita contending for the same woman, uh, but only one can have her. Um, and while I wouldn't say that Emily gets away with, with whatever she wants, um, in this story, yeah, I think in, in the world of the Fablio, the hot girl is always the winner, no matter what. And then Chaucer's disclaimer, as I mentioned before, early on, the knight, I mean, the knight, the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the miller, says, uh, if you don't like this story, don't blame me, blame the beer. Um, and then Chaucer turns around and says, if you don't like this story, don't blame me, blame the miller. And, of course, this is all Chaucer's child. This is all Chaucer's, you know, creation. So if anyone's to blame, it's him. And he knows that. I mean, he's, he's got his tongue very much in cheek. But one thing he does say, he says, you know, first of all, don't blame me, blame the miller. And second of all, men should not make earnest out of game. Don't take a joke so seriously. It's just a joke. There is no Nicholas. There is no Allison. There is no John the Carpenter. Um, it's, it's, it's just a joke, you know, live a little, lighten up, have a laugh. Um, don't be so prudish. Uh, I, he seems to be saying, uh, if you don't like this kind of story, you don't have to read it. He says, turn the page. He says, you'll find plenty of things in my tales, both religious and historical and chivalrous and everything else. You don't uh, have to read this. Of course, Dr. Parker is making you read it. Um, but uh, in Chaucer's day, I guess you didn't have to read it if you didn't want to. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. Like I said, find a translation that's funny uh, and good and, and clear. And, and if you don't get it the first time, read through it again because it really is funny. Uh, it's really worth reading. And um, it's the best of the Fablio. We'll see a couple more, but this is certainly the one uh, I think that he, he does the best. So uh, good luck with that. I'll post some um, discussion questions in the next day or so and let you have at it.